Thank you for joining us for a FreightWave special report on the Celadon closure. Yeah, this is an incredibly tough story we've been covering since Friday evening, and our CEO, Craig Fuller, joins us now. And obviously, we broke the news around 10 o'clock Friday evening when an internal source said they were going to file for bankruptcy. And then from there, kind of news started picking up and picking up because Celadon never released a comment until this morning, then official word was put out that 4,000 people are now without a job. This, this is an incredibly, this is a tough story to report and tough one to follow, especially the timing of it right before the holidays. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is a company that's been around for 35 years. Uh, it's uh, 30, 34 years, 35 years. So it's it's got a long legacy. It was the dominant leader of that cross-border traffic. It was a NAFTA trucking company. I mean, it was built and really sort of saw its uh, rise through uh, the NAFTA legislation and the cross-border activity. And uh, it's a very sad story because I remember as a kid of this industry, as a trucking brat, if you will, uh, looking up to Celadon as a company that uh, was a leader in its space. And uh, it, it's it's quite sad. I, I have some friends that uh, are at the company, have been at the company for many years, and um, it's just sad to see the company's mismanagement do this. Yeah, and we've been reporting there have been, you know, legal indictments. We've been talking about legal things, and it's just, it's not great because it's it's a few people are responsible for a tragedy like this one, and that's that's not great. No, it is a few people. Um, you know, first started off as negligence. I don't think initially uh, that they set out to necessarily uh, commit fraud. Now, maybe— uh, they did, but certainly they covered up their tracks and basically cooked the books. Because what happened is, and I think it's important to understand what actually took place, is that, that effectively the valuations of the equipment uh, were uh, not marked to market. So marked to market means that uh, you you basically are listing the value of your assets based on current market conditions. And if you have new information about where the prices of used trucks are, you should be marking those to the current price. They didn't do that. Uh, they kept the higher values of the trucks on their uh, books. And and this is very Enron-esque, because what they, and this is literally what Enron did, was uh, Enron got ahead of itself. Uh, or uh, was, And so what they did was they started to create these separate entities where they could take the money and sell it to that new entity so they could show a high value. And then uh, that second entity was responsible for liquidating the trucks. And so effectively what happened is, now here's the issue, is that the second entity uh, was only first position on the trucks. Celadon was backstopping the value. So effectively they were holding on to the downside risk, uh, and that wasn't technically offloaded. They did not disclose that, which is where they got in trouble, is they, they maintain these high values. So if you looked at uh, what happened during the Enron case, it's exactly what Enron did, was that Enron was selling uh, products to a, a, a separate entity that they owned uh, and, and then would buy products. It was this sort of like uh, uh, really complicated accounting. And that's, that's what they did. And, and unfortunately for them, they believed that the market would eventually come back in prices and they thought they could catch up and they didn't. Uh, and so uh, to hide their issues, they just effectively put out bad financials and had a local accounting firm that was willing to uh, uh, let them sort of uh, justify this. And so we've seen this play out before, not in trucking necessarily. I mean, certainly it has happened in trucking, but not at the scale. Uh, Roadrunner Transportation Systems is another one that's been accused of doing some stuff irregular, I think, for different reasons. Um, but this is, uh, this is Enron-esque in its nature, and I think you have to remember that. Now, Enron... When the story came out about Enron, uh, the thing folded within weeks. Uh, this, uh, you know, I think they had a couple of years to sort of recover, and unfortunately were always sort of playing behind the times, and the market didn't hold up. Why do you think we were one of the only news outlets to pick up this story and cover it? Because we put it out Friday night, and it a lot of rumors started percolating over the weekend because we were the only ones really... Running with it, we were hearing from drivers on face groups, groups who were saying that loads were being were being dropped, but they were being told it was also business as usual. Yeah, we got tipped off uh, Friday morning, uh, and there had been rumors out there for many, many months, but we got tipped off Friday morning that uh, some of the Lindors uh, were actually foreclosing on equipment. 
And when you see that, it's like, well, the lenders, you got to understand the OEMs, uh, the companies that are lending, the, le- the leasing companies, finance companies, don't want equipment right now because they, like, they don't want that stuff piling up on their yards because they have the issue of having to effectively write that, you know, that, that shows up on their yards. It hurts the uh, resale value of these trucks. But for some reason, uh, I think they were behind payments, so they basically foreclosed on the equipment. And I think what happened in this situation is that everybody was wanting, it's almost like a run of the bank, where one party gets nervous, another party hears about it and gets nervous, and then everybody gets nervous. And then what happened is that Celadon's management made the decision that they were going to uh, file Chapter 11 uh, midweek uh, this coming week. And uh, when they they contacted their top ship, you know, top customers or, or customers uh, across their business on Friday afternoon, uh, shippers started pulling freight. We we got wind of it on Friday morning, but didn't we had enough to write the story? But because of the sensitivity, the fact this is a publicly traded company, and the fact that we're talking about four thousand jobs, we had to be right. We had to make sure we were right. So we waited until. We had internal confirmation that what that you know that this situation is what it is, and then we published the story at you know ten o'clock on Friday. We were the first media outlet uh, that published it and pushed it over social media and stuff. And and I think what it did was it showed that um, uh, that there's just a lot of questions. Now the challenge was that the company itself did not get out in front of the story. What they should have done, and it's easy for us to play money board and quarterback. I wasn't in that situation. Uh, I, I'm sure there's a lot of sensitivities around bankruptcy laws and public traded shareholders and what do you tell the employees and how do we get, we get the equipment back and how like you've got a lot of parties you got to deal with and it's easy for us to sort of play money into quarterback. The unfortunate reality is that the this was a PR crisis and well you and I talked about the fact that it became a PR crisis because the drivers who oftentimes uh, feel like they're always left out of the loop and they are uh, oftentimes it just started to compound itself. And I don't think the company realized how powerful social media is, uh, because this is a new world. Yeah. Like, like uh, I was thinking about this this morning. A lot of these companies have never had this amount of coverage before, but with freight waves, uh, us being in this realm now, we're able to get the word out so fast. And you mentioned it, drivers rely on social media. Mm-hmm. That is how they talk. And that is a major outlet that we use to get our news out there. So we're the ones giving them these facts. And it was it was funny because there was a statement. I was watching some of the feed, uh, and I sent I I sent this to you, uh, which is one of the drivers said has a major media outlet covered it, and another driver responded (laughs) and said, "In our industry, Freight Waves is the major media outlet." I think the 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 point that they were making was, why hasn't CNN, Fox? You know, uh, MSNBC, CNBC. Why haven't they come out with it? And I think, you know, let's be honest. This is a big deal in our business. It's a big in our business. It in the global scheme of things, it's not a huge deal, and it's unfortunate for the people of Indianapolis. It's certainly a big story in Indianapolis. Not as big. The problem is trucking is a, a, a market that very few people understand, and they don't understand the implications of it. And because of it, it. it, it, it you, they also want to make sure that they have their own facts. And these are not, it's not like General Electric. Like if GE were folding or when WorldCom went down or NMO went down, these are companies that are, are highly visible. Trucking doesn't get that kind no. of following. Frankly, that's why companies like Freight Waves are successful because we don't have to deal with competition from Fox or yeah. whatever that can really dive into the story. And I think for us, this was a, a chance to put information out there and, uh, it did take on a life of its own. But it, I think it's interesting because I, I think most companies, and particularly in freight, are unprepared for social media. It, and, and look, it, it is amazing how fast information is traveling these days. But it, And it's not just trucking. I mean, even in Silicon Valley, look what's happened to Facebook. Yeah. Like, like, or Uber. I mean, Uber, one, one employee wrote an op-ed that basically ended up and culminated in this, the founder and CEO that built one of the fastest growing companies in the history of, of, of time being ousted and i don't think people understand the power of social media and it's it's evolving so fast that it becomes pretty scary one of the boards that told the story of social media was the celadon drivers assistance group we're going to talk to bridget from that group now we're going to bring her up on the line hi Hi, Bridget. bridget Hi, Bridget. Thank you for joining us on our Celadon Special Report here at Freight Waves. I'm Dooner here with Freight Waves CEO Craig Fuller and Emily Zink. 
Hey, how are you, Bridget? I'm okay. How are you doing? Uh, we're, we're, we're doing good down here. We're certainly thinking about the folks across the country and in Indianapolis that have been impacted and disrupted, uh, right before the holidays. Why did you, Absolutely. Yeah, why did you feel the need? You have, you have the Facebook group kind of give a little bit of background on that, but why did you feel the need so quickly to jump on this story and offer assistance? Um, with that many drivers that were going to be displaced and with, the office support staff and mechanics and everybody else that was going to be displaced. We knew that um, there were going to be so many people that were going to be out of a job and um, you can't help everybody that quickly. Um, you know, I know that uh, they are helping people with a bus ticket and, and that kind of thing. But um, you know, there's there's going to be people without a job like um office staff and and that kind of thing that just weren't going to be able to get help quick enough and um drivers that weren't going to be able to get help quick enough are going to be stranded and um so we and i kept seeing posts in other groups and um How did this narrative unfold on your board? Because we put the story up on late Friday night and then we ourselves were following on social media. It's funny, too, because social media used to be looked at as like untrustworthy or something you shouldn't look at. But in trucking and I'm not sure it's necessarily unique to trucking, but for Facebook is such a sounding off platform for truckers. Huge communities form there. Your own community brought in over a thousand members within 24 hours. Tell us how the story unfolded there and, and how were you guys helping to channel information? Because a lot of the information truckers were getting were from their own like Qualcomm systems where they're being told not to trust social media. Um, yeah, we, we tried not to, to relay rumors and that type of thing. We were trying to talk to director, uh, dr- drivers directly where we were uh, trying not to get anything until we saw information directly from people. Um, so it was, um, or until we had stuff that was from, um, you know, news articles and, and that type of thing, we weren't trying to do rumors. It was, it was, um, we were trying to get legitimate resources, um, and, and trying to, to pass it that way. There was a lot of things that we got that were just rumors and they didn't come through. Um, so it, it, it unfolded quickly and, and, um, it, it, it is amazing how quickly things unfolded. I, I can't believe it's, it's astonishing how quickly things people responded, how quickly people responded. I can't believe how many people came into the group so fast. Well, I think we had over a half, in between all the articles we posted the night, we're over a half million that have read the actual story. And then it's been syndicated through, like Business Insider, Rachel Premack has written about it. And I think it just became this really uh, big story. Uh, I think a lot of the, uh, certainly the drivers that were impacted were looking for information, looking for you guys to give them information because I think everyone was wanting guidance. And I think that, right. uh, and then other recruiters, I mean, we're living in a world that's connected 24, seven, three sixty five. And let's, let's be honest. I mean, you've got 4,000 or I think 3,200 drivers. I don't know exact number that are out there that are considered high quality. I mean, Celadon hires really high quality drivers and you don't see this kind of driver pool enter the market that quickly. And I think, I think when the fuel cards started shutting down, cause I was in the same boat, like we had, you know, without talking who our sources are, we have really reliable information, inside information, what's going on, but it, but it didn't seem real until the fuel card started shutting down. That's when it, for me, it was like, okay, this is actually absolutely going to happen without a doubt. And when it got, when the car, the fuel cards got shut down, got turned back on and then got shut down again, it just suggested that mm-hmm. something was completely dysfunctional and it became very apparent that it was going to happen. And I think the other thing that was really uh, sort of scary or, or uh, from my point of view is the fact that the company wasn't releasing any information that dis- disregarded the, the media or the social media aspects. That was a real telling sign because it meant that they were in a hunker down mode that if it was, if it was untrue, they would have put something out immediately. 
and they weren't reachable consistently. Right. Drivers could reach them. They couldn't reach them. It was so inconsistent. Bridget, have you been speaking with any any drivers, operations people within Celadon? I know we spoke a little bit earlier, and you said that you know there's a lot of uh, a lot of broken hearts. A lot of people are very prideful at that company. You see the comments on your board, and there are people who just even getting this message, they're like, "I'm still going to deliver my last load." There's not some of the newer drivers might be a little bit bitter, but some of the older ones, I was just kind of taken back by how much how loyal they were to a company that was that was shutting down. I I talked to. Not really higher up, more be- behind the scenes staff, um, you know, accounting people, um, that type of thing. Not really anybody that's higher up. So, um, and they're just as devastated. I, th- I think, you know, it's interesting because you look at this from a side. This has been a story that's played out over three to four years because it, it really started with the accounting shenanigans that happened. Is there a sense of like, as a, as a group at Celadon, that you're all in it together. You've had this sort of change in management. You've had, you know, the founder has passed away. Was there a sense among some of the folks that have been there for a while that we're in it together and we're going to see this thing to the end? Uh, do you think that sort of drove uh, sort of the experience until the end? I, you know, the one, the, one of the per- people that I talked to, um, she said that it felt like they were family. And that was um, something that I've seen consistently with the drivers as well, that they felt like family. Um, And and so um, that may be a huge part of of what's going on with um, staying staying with their loads and and wanting to see it through the end and wanting to see the the reformation and not wanting to believe it. And and it's part of the grieving process as well. You know, people go through that grieving process, that disbelief, that denial. Yeah, I think this is a huge change. Yeah. Even if you read Celadon when they no longer have their Facebook active, but they would use the word family. They would do posts about their employees celebrating birthdays and milestones. And so I think Dooner touched on a great point that people, they're upset, they're sad, but it's, it's not a lot of hate towards the company. It's more just they're at a loss because it, they were a part of a family. They were a part of this group that they felt so connected with. And I, I, I hope that all of them are able to find companies where they have that same feeling of being a part of a family. Yeah. Bridget, how do people join your group and get more information? I know Facebook has been a great source for it. And you guys have done a great job of of making sure that some of the, the scam offers and some of the scam recruits have been taken down. So um, how do they go and learn more? Uh, they can join the group through um, it's, it's Celadon Assistance and uh Celadon Closure, I can't even remember the name of the group. <laughs> um, Celadon, uh, ah. I believe it's, it's Celadon whir- Closure Assistance. It's, it's, it's been a whirlwind for Bridget uh, and everybody. Yeah, I've been following her just like us. We've basically yeah. since Friday, we haven't gotten much sleep. We've been doing media every single day. We've been doing radio and Bridget on her site has been uh, working as a moderator and admin, making sure that. Uh, scam GoFundMes and stuff weren't on there and the uh, right information yeah. was getting out. It's a tough time. People get very exploitive in these things, but a lot of people want to help too. And trucking is uh, very unique in how quickly people run to the aid of one another. Bridget, thank you so much. I, for I, I, can your... I have one more question yeah. for Bridget? I, Bridget, I'm curious from your perspective, do, is there any uh, uh, tension towards the current management or do people recognize this for what it was, is the fact that it was a turnaround? I don't know that there's anything towards the current management. Um, you know, things that I saw was, you know, don't don't forget they're in it just like we are. They're losing their jobs just like we are. Um, and that type of thing. It's, um, yeah, I think it's easy to get critical. Like, we, we can always, I mean, it's easy for us and everybody to be critical and play money board quarterback about how things could have gone. But we're not having yeah. to deal with the lawyers yeah. and the, the bankruptcy attorneys and then messaging. Right. Like, that's the thing that it's unfortunate it happened and un- unraveled as fast as it did. You know, you said something like it, it unraveled so fast and it it literally in one respect took years to unravel. But you, you could see how close they were to the edge this weekend for the fact that literally 
all happened was our article and the social media yeah. simply just pushed them over the edge. Like yeah. that it was the little tipping point that caused this thing to fall. But it was it obviously was already there. All we did was do a tiny tap and, and it fell apart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the group name is Celadon Closure Assistance at Jobs. Um, all they need to do is apply to the group and answer a few questions. And um, they can either seek assistance, whether they're an employee, a former employee of Celadon. And there are other companies that are also being impacted um, by closures. We are going to be updating the name of the group as um, Celadon transitions out of the closure process. Um, we will be changing the name of the group to, um, to something um, more general um, so that it's helping more people that are going as other companies close and that kind of thing. Hopefully no more companies close, but um, thank, thank you so much, Bridget. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, yeah, we recommend you check out that group. Here's my thing, Craig, if we wanted to publish that story, 4,000 people would have woken up today to just a shock and a surprise. I, I think that's right. I, you know, I had some conversations with people internally uh, and that were connected to the company that were not internal. And, and there was this whole discussion about whether whether getting the information out there was helpful or hurtful. And there's there's two ways to look at it. One is the, this probably did get out before the company was their plan. They had a plan and yeah. it didn't go into effect. I think the counter argument to that is customers were aware of it. Lenders were aware of it. I think, frankly, what happened is over the weekend, at least it had there was time for things to to work themselves out. Had we had woken up to Monday morning and this had taken place, I think it would have been just utter chaos because at least on the weekend, there isn't a lot of freight that's being unloaded or loaded, and you have time to sort of facilitate it. Um, you know, the original plan, as I understand it, was midweek, which I took as Wednesday. I don't know if that's what they meant, but midweek was the original plan, and basically the the, the information leaking uh, basically got it out uh, a little bit earlier. But it, I did talk to people who internally were like, I'm having to deal with this mess, but so thank you. But also, um, I think they were being sarcastic. They weren't thanking me. But we're also uh, commenting on the fact that it probably was helpful that it was over the weekend. And you got to remember, we, we do focus a lot on the drivers because they're the most visible and they're the ones that are looking for information. But you have 500 employees that are at corporate, you have all of the clients and customers and shippers that are now trying to figure out where their freight's at that's in transit. You have the vendors, you have the agent. You have, this is a not, we're talking about a 4,000 person company, but we're also should be thinking about the tens of thousands of people that are a part of that uh, ecosystem. You know, look, shareholders, I, you know, I owned, I don't even know, like a, a couple thousand shares of it, uh, which, I, I took as a flyer, and I knew the risks of buying into it. But I, there, this is a this is a big company. Yeah, I mean, we we felt so confident. We went on national radio this weekend, so confident in your sources, and thought it was that important to get the information out. We opened up the line, and we heard from a lot of drivers. We'll go through a couple of these calls so we can hear the story. Kind of unfolded in real time. It was these are these are some of them are a little hard to hear. But hi, how's it going? Well, it's it's been a nightmare. Some of them got the notice last night. Some of them got the notice today. They are letting go of the dedicated lanes first. They've been told that they either no longer have a job or that they have to clean out their trucks by Monday. The DMs are saying, you know, everything is business as normal, but then some of the other DMs are really being honest and they're trying their best to, you know, circumvent the calm data issue and get them enough fuel so that they can drop their trucks at the terminal nearest to their house. Um, oh. But they're threatening, you know, if the drivers don't take the trucks to the terminal, that, that it's going to hit their DAC report and then they're going to fine them for whatever it takes to recover the truck. So a lot of people are scrambling. A lot of, a lot of good people are just completely heartbroken. And, and I feel for them because it's coming with no notice right before the holidays. It's really sad. But what are the people you talk to? What are they saying? Most of them are trying to um, just get home before, like, to at least clean out their trucks. I've been on the phone since about 6 o'clock this morning. I just got off the phone right before I called in. I've been on the phone pretty solid the entire time, just talking to different people. Um, 
uh, one of the drivers that I know that is still there is under a load and had me on silent so he so I could hear exactly what the DMs were saying and they were saying business as usual but you know it's just a bunch of rumors but if you do get out there you know get the load delivered and then you know we'll get you a bus ticket home if if need be and so that's not really what somebody wants to hear when they live on the other side of the country but they most people are are either at shippers right now and they're refusing to load them and so they don't have a load anyways and so they're just trying to get to a terminal get fuel first get to a terminal or get home and just just try to you know get there before the storm hits um the latest word is that um, there's a closed door meeting Sunday night to discuss the bankruptcy and it should be finalized like around midnight so it's it's a very sad deal you know, and that, that really bared out because that, that message was sent out to the drivers around, I think it was 1232. Yeah. And we saw that message on Facebook, Craig. Remember the one from their director of operations who basically gave a goodbye. He went on the Facebook groups and was like, thank you for all your service. God bless. I hope you are. I hope you have a great. So I guess maybe at midnight that really did go go down. Do you- yeah, I think, uh, I mean, look, I, I there was discussions as, as I understood it on Friday that the company was still trying to figure out what they could do. That didn't work out, obviously. I do think the time that the uh, when when what happened over the weekend, drivers think about fleeing, this panic, everything became unsalvageable. I mean, you think about it. I I was thinking about this yesterday, and I tweeted it. Is that if you're a client, if you're a shipper of Celadon, why in the world would you have loaded a single trailer? Like I don't care what it is. And hay is sort of like if there's a rock gut uh, commodity, (laughs) it's hay because like it doesn't pay. Yeah, and um, the. The uh, you're not going to load that because you don't know if it's going to even you don't know where it's ending up. It doesn't matter how reliable Celadon has been in the past. It was interesting because I had talked to uh, uh, somebody at Celadon that talked about how great their service was in some of these accounts. They were getting really high service credentials. They were always uh, very reputable as a carrier. It's unfortunate that they're no longer with us because they, they're they're always considered a high quality carrier. And I, I just I, I'm sad. This is a sad situation. Listen. Let's, let's well, let's unpack what she said real quick. It's two things that are really interesting. What what do you think is the right procedure in this? For example, she was saying that they weren't being told anything over the weekend, and they were being told, but they were also being told if they abandon their trucks, they'll get hit on a DAC report. So, what should a trucker do in a situation like that? Uh, well, I think you know, frankly, I, let me say this. I I think the company has given directions to the drivers, which is go to a terminal or go to a truck stop. And, and they've given very specific instructions. Clarissa did this as well. Uh, basically, keep the keys in and you know, hide the keys, take a photo of the truck, and notify the company where you can find that truck and trailer. Um, I think they should do that. Do not, under any circumstances, park your rig on the side of the road because you could be, as a driver, held liable if, if a car happens to hit that. So make sure you go to a truck stop, to a terminal, or, you know, an alternative is go to a com- If you're g- getting a recruiting job, let's say you get a job at, you know, name it, Swift or whatever. You, I would imagine that Swift, Tim, and I'm not trying to pick on Swift, any company put sure. fill in the blanks, would be willing to let that truck sit for a day or two or a week and would be willing to let you park your vehicle there. And it's safe. And the reason I say that it would be a good idea is if you're a carrier, you're trying to help the driver out, you want the driver to work for you, so you want to make it easy. And second of all, you have secured parking, and you're going to work with the lenders. You know what that's like, and you have resources. So I would say that, and I think carriers should be should welcome that. I know there's a tendency of not wanting the drive the, the trucks to take up your lot, but let's remind you this is an exceptional situation. Everyone's frustrated, and the folks that sell it on are not competitors anymore. They're done. Yeah. So I would encourage the entire industry to help those trucks be parked in a safe parking spot, so that there isn't this constant disruption. And we have people on our Facebook feeds right now who are still with their trucks, in their Celadon trucks, waiting for some kind of direction. And what Craig just said was great because we did consult uh, Clarissa with our, with she is legal counsel. So that was, you know, good information there. But people are so loyal to the company yeah. that they are continuing to stick with their trucks. So I think that just says about the high quality drivers that are now looking for jobs in I've seen on these boards, somebody said on Saturday they went out looking for a new job because they had read FreightWaves.com. And they're like, you know, I need a job. And they were hired within four hours. Yeah, I mean, the, the truth is that the drive, this is, again, a high-quality driver pool. You just don't see the opportunities this quick. 
let's not forget that uh, there are 500 people who are not drivers that also need jobs. So let's not, I don't want to dismiss that. And I'm not, look, what's happened to the drivers is really important, but there are another 500 people that are not going to have recruiters call them left and right. So as an industry, let's not forget that there are a lot of people that are available that have a ton of quote unquote tribal knowledge in Indianapolis. Like if I'm a startup and I'm looking to open my next office, why not Indianapolis? Like, why not get talent that understands the industry? You're going to find 500 people who are highly, highly employable sitting in Indianapolis. That just doesn't happen that often. And it's a great city to do business. It's a great city. And we've seen it, you know, in Chattanooga when it wasn't a a shutdown, but it was a situation where uh, 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 Coyote bought American uh, Access American. All of a sudden, all of those employees entered the market. We've had 20 companies that spent off of that. I, I hope that happens with Celadon. I hope that some of these opportunities uh, are created and maybe sell, uh, maybe Indianapolis becomes an, uh, a center of innovation because of this. Let's go to a couple more calls because we, we had some uh, we had some really interesting ones, again, as this story unfolded in real time to us uh, on the air. From the Canadian side now to let us know what's going on uh, north of the border. I know that they have uh, affiliates over there as well. Uh, and another anonymous caller, I think some of you, are, are you still employed with Celadon? Oh, uh, no. I left when uh, the news came out and all our prime runs got cut. Uh, We had a lot of drivers. Uh, They basically cut our fuel cards, sold off all the trucks. Majority of it, it was hell. So I, it was a hard thing because Hyman was very good to me, so on and so forth. And then once everything got released, Celadon got kicked off the stock market. All hell broke loose. And I know Hyman's just been limping along. They sold their inner mogul division to a company called Bison. And a friend of mine got impacted by that. He just basically got walked out, and that was it for him. So, Paul, uh, what do you got for us? Yellow. Uh, yeah, I used to work for Celadon. I used to be an independent contractor with them. And, I mean, I noticed the change back in 16 when they were selling some of the new trailers they were getting coming in. And, I mean, my work, my wife is a CPA. She used to work for the IRS and do audited on these big companies. And she said that's a red flag back then. Why were yeah. they selling off trailers and equipment and everything else? She is on the line. She's calling in from Indiana, and she says her husband is a driver for on and he just started relatively recently, Misty? Yes, back in uh, on May 13th. When did you find out about all this information? How did you find out? Well, we just found out, like, we woke up this morning and it was all over Facebook. One more before we go into the break. It's Jessica from Alabama. She's a Celadon driver. She says they haven't told them anything. She found out from FedEx workers. Uh, last night, went into FedEx to pick up a load to have the FedEx worker tell me that they had... Uh, unloaded our Celadon trailer and that we would have no freight going forward. We are the ones that actually called dispatch. They didn't know anything about it. And it took approximately an hour, hour and a half for them to realize and get notice from FedEx that they had pulled all Celadon loads. Yeah. So there, right there, it's the drivers that we're hearing from. And it's extremely, extremely sad. But you did make that point. There's 500 people in the offices who need jobs. And I just stumbled across this guy, William Bevel. He is the customer relationship analyst at Celadon saying you need to, you know, our admin and our drivers need work. He has 10 years of customer experience with the company. And it's just... What's his name? uh, His name is William B-E-V-I-L-L-E. He is looking for some kind of customer service job in the transportation industry and there's going to be a lot of stories there's going to be a lot of the of the people and uh william thanks for reaching out uh i'm sure that you and your colleagues are just devastated we are my heart goes out to you and everyone here um we are actually working on a job board a free job board where celadon employees and former celadon employees and really anybody that's been uh, in the industry looking for work uh, can go there we'll have that up this afternoon we're literally getting it up um, and again, I think the best place is LinkedIn. If I can make one recommendation to anybody, I hire a lot of people directly from LinkedIn. That's how uh, Dooner and I connected. So I know if you haven't been looking for a job, because this is the this is the crisis that that we talk about. It sounds like he's been there ten years. Yeah. Oh, well, he's been uh, 
yeah, it looks like 10 years in customer service, not 10 years there. It looks like three years there. Okay, but think about this, is that some of these people have been at Celadon for 20, 30 years. They haven't had to look for a job yeah. or update a resume, yeah. probably are rusty uh, uh, dealing with interviews. And social media is completely different, and how to find jobs in this market is different. I think, Emily, one thing I'd like to suggest that we do is why don't we sit down and talk, uh, talk about at some point today or tomorrow what it's like finding a job in this environment? Because I just don't think, I don't know what you do. Like, if you haven't done it in 20 years, I remember I went to, you know, after I left my last company, it, trying to find a job is different. It's a different world. You you connect through Twitter and LinkedIn. You're not you're not just sending your resume to whatever website they have out there. You're not I've doing tried that, that anymore. I've done like the Indeed thing, and it just seems like it you're sending work. them into like a you black don't. pit. You and don't the, hear anything back. You don't hear anything because like I, I we get resumes all the time, and I hire a lot of folks, and we get you know on a typical posting in Chattanooga, Tennessee, so not Indianapolis. I, we may get 150, 200 jobs, and if you're talking about jobs that have very similar. Uh, criteria. So if you're a customer service manager at Celadon, there are probably 80 other of you also looking for the same jobs. They're going to be applying. And how do you differentiate yourself and how do you connect? The best way to do that is networking. And I know some people are not, there's not built to do that. I am, you are, Dooner, you are, we're networkers. It just comes natural to us. I, it's going to be it's going to be really really tough and it's unfortunate. You know they know the power of social media. A lot of these truckers do, and a lot of these operations people do from Facebook. And like you mentioned, go over to LinkedIn. You'd be surprised at how receptive CEOs are of companies. And to be honest, in the past ten years, I've never gotten a job not by connecting. The only way I have is by connecting with a CEO or a president of a company and been personally offered a job by them. I've got a lot of messages from people saying, "Hey, we're hiring. Let people know that we're hiring on LinkedIn." So definitely, like you said, LinkedIn is your your friend. You have office. to be on LinkedIn. You yeah. have to have a profile. Like, honestly, resumes these days um, are not as important as a quality LinkedIn profile. Uh, I will tell you when that I rarely hire from resumes. Um, I normally hire from LinkedIn, and it's my first go-to. Like, I look at the resumes, but I actually look at the LinkedIn. And what I'm trying to understand is, is this person, you know, are they keeping it up to date, and are they, are they reflective? Now, I do think that uh, the best place to connect like i i get so many inbound requests from people and i will say be very specific the most powerful thing you can do so i get probably i don't know 150 linkedin uh, inbounds a day um just because we're very visible in media. Yeah. you probably do as well you do as well and the thing that really drives me crazy is when people say i want 15 minutes of your time they don't tell me why yeah and i'm like why like what do you want to talk about and i'm fine <laughs> like if you said hey I'm looking for work. I would love to come work for you. And they said that. I would say, okay, I will immediately get back to them and say, I appreciate this, and I'm going to pass your information on. Um, that is the best way. Like, be direct. Contact the CEOs that you want to work with and say, I want to come work for you. I like what you're doing. Just be, you don't, being indirect and passive is not going to get you a job in this market. That was great advice there, coming directly from a CEO. So that, I that's cannot old. stand, yeah. I want to have coffee with you. Yeah. Like, no. just yeah. be a date. freaking direct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, like, like, okay, why do you want to have coffee with me? Like, what is it you want? I don't like that. I like very direct statements. And it says something about the employee that has the confidence to come to me and say what they want. And so. Yeah. Well, one last thing is, uh, your dog walked in here. We had a dog in the booth. Uh, there's been people on social media who drive with their dogs, yeah. and they've been having to get their belongings, and... I guess at the yard over there, they have 20 minutes to unload. It's, it's very hard on people. A lot of them with pets, though, are looking for, for new gigs. How do they go and source a job, these drivers with pets? Yeah, I don't, I, I'm not an expert at this. I do know that a lot of the carriers uh, do have pet policies, um, and they have, they, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty uh, liberal in terms of what pets you can have. But they, you know, certain, like, uh, certain breeds uh, are restrictive. It's usually weight and size and you know, pit bulls and, 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 and breeds that have a reputation yeah. uh, are probably not going to be as open. But I think the recruiters of the companies can tell you that. Or connecting on social media and, and asking drivers that work for different companies, like, you know, Hirschbach has been pretty uh, active on social media, has a great reputation. Ask the recruiters there, hey, do you let pets? And make it an open forum. I think everybody wants to know this. Um, like, let's just ask these questions. I mean, we're all dog owners, too, and I think that if, if I lost my job, it would be that much easier to, to walk out with my, my dog than do that lonely, lonely oh, ride. Oh, I, I can't. I mean, let's, let's just be honest. And, and one thing, Emily, we've talked about this over the weekend is that 
trucking is a very, very social isolating job. And, and even, you know, I can't imagine my wife being in a truck, like we'd murder each other. Mm. And, and so, you know, drivers that are either driving team or even alone, it's very isolating. And I think that's what's made this much more stressful over the weekend is the isolation factor. And so I can't imagine, like if I were a driver, I would certainly want Ellie with me. Ellie's our dog. Like she is my company. Like when my wife leaves to go visit family and the kids are out, Ellie's there. I feel, you know, much more comfort. You live alone. I think you feel and, much more Yeah, comfort. with my dog. Yeah. And you got to think all these people are sitting in their trucks by themselves, going through social media, wondering what their future holds. That is the most isolating feeling in the world. It's, so it's got to be tough. Yeah, yeah, the ones who have their dogs. And someone reached out to me and said Celadon was so welcoming of pets. They embraced the drivers. They would showcase on their Facebook page, if you look, they would showcase the drivers who had dogs. So, yeah, there are a lot of groups in these uh, on these job boards on Facebook. They're saying, hey, we are dog friendly because they know that a lot of the Celadon drivers really like to travel with pets, which I would love to, too. What's left for our coverage for the day? Now we're going to have What the Truck at 3.30. Anything else coming up that people can stay tuned on for social media or check out on Freight Waves TV, download the app? So we have reporters all over the country, which is the beauty of our business. So we have a reporter, Clarissa, who is on the way to Indianapolis. So if you are there in Indy and would like to talk to her, please look for her. We also have a crew at a terminal about 90 minutes south of oh, us. Yeah, Stephen just texted so, yeah. me. He said he he's here. He's waiting at the local truck stop for some of the drivers there. They're talking to him, but they're uh, they're hoping not to get booted out. While they yeah. And they're in Gadsden, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, Gadsden, Alabama. They're down there. It's, it's ninety miles south. We do have Indianapolis. Clarissa's headed up there. I, I, you know, I look. I definitely want to tell the driver's story, but I also, and I, I, I don't want to think I'm not concerned about drivers because I absolutely am. Uh, but I just think there's a lot of resources for yes. drivers. I really worry about these long-term people who have worked in the business because running a trucking company is not just about the truck. Yeah. You got to keep that thing maintained. You got to think the thing uh, when there's a breakdown, you got to deal with it. That's a tough job. And uh, the people that are best at it have been doing it for over 10, 20 years. And not to so. mention the brokers. I mean, that's I, I've done that gig. I've been a broker. I started at 29,000. I mean, yeah, the broker business did get sold off yeah. uh, to P&S. And uh, so I, I think the transition's happening. I don't know the status of those employees. But even the ops people, I mean, they're, well, they're not the highest paid for job. sure. I mean, they're not. They're not. They're not highest paid. And you've got customer service reps that are dealing with customers that have all of the knowledge of how these customers work. They know what the high quality freight is. You have the fleet managers and driver managers that have been dealing with dispatch. You have breakdown. And the look, breakdown, these are the people that know how the trucks are operated and are built. There's so much knowledge that has entered the, the market in Indianapolis. And I just encourage people to take advantage of the opportunity to get some really high quality people. Celadon was uh, at its peak, was a was one of the most profitable, most successful carriers. And frankly, would still be if it wasn't for those SOBs that came and ruined the business. And I, I think hopefully they'll serve jail time and get justice. I just, I'm so angry for the people of Celadon. And, and look, at, you know, it's interesting. I don't know how you guys felt, but this weekend was a lot of adrenaline. Like for even for us covering it, sort of. Yeah. The yeah. It didn't hit me until this morning when I saw it was official. Like when I saw the Wall Street Journal article, uh, my heart sunk for the people because I'm like, this is real. This is beyond a story and beyond speculation and beyond uh, content coming from the company. It's absolutely real. It is so real and it's so scary. And I just feel horrible. It, it's sad, but also at the same time, it has been amazing to see how people have rallied behind these employees and they're continuing to do so. And I think that's what makes the trucking community so unique is it is one big family. Everyone is a competitor, but you see in a time in a crisis like this, everyone is willing to help. Yeah, yeah, and as Craig mentioned, this extends way beyond. It's a supply chain. It's not just one link. It extends. Uh, it extends from shareholders to shippers to to the people repairing the trucks to the drivers. So if you've been impacted by this, uh, we, we wish you the best. I, I want to say one thing, and I don't know because I haven't heard directly, but I don't think there's severance for the office employees. I think the drivers are going to be paid through the end of their run, uh, and I understand that the uh, driver employee uh, uh, payroll folks are are going to stay and assist in that, as well as the contractor payments. But I don't think the office employees are getting any severance. If you imagine, like, a lot of – keep in mind, trucking is not a high-paying no. job. If you're making a customer service job or a break job, uh, down job and you've living, you're living paycheck to paycheck or living just tightly, this is an unexpected welcome at a time when it's going to be incredibly difficult to find jobs. And there isn't severance to get them through the holidays. So let's keep that in mind. 
uh, that uh, this is going to be a really tough uh, period for some folks. Our heart goes out to them. We're going to continue to bring light to the story. Uh, and I think we're going to talk some point today about how do you connect with people uh, for job opportunities. Yeah. So Emily and I are going to dive into that um, uh, sometime later today. What time is that, Emily? We could. Do you want to do it during What the Truck at around the 3.30 to 4.30 time? certainly can do yeah. that. I, so I, if people want to tune in. If, yeah, let, let me, can I check my yeah, schedule? Yeah, you could check your schedule if <laughs> that you know, doesn't Aston, hijack your show. Aston, no, come on, come on. Aston it's a would special be, What the yeah. Truck. Aston would be great. At yeah, she, she's our HR, so she would She would. I would actually have, have, have her yeah. there as well. Uh, yeah, I can do that. i got to pick up. Yes, I, I'm good till about 4.15. Okay. okay, tune in at 3.30 yes. to a very special What the Truck where we'll uh, talk about some of the employment opportunities. If you want to continue the conversation, you can find him on Twitter at Freight Alley. She's at Emily Zink. That's S-Z-I-N-K. And I'm at Timothy Dooner. We'd be happy to hear from you and learn more since social media has kind of told this narrative anyway. Yeah. Take care and God bless.